Here we are again, a long time we didn't have an interview in English, and today we will have one with Gina Donaldson, and she's in America, and we were together in a group, in Zoom group, logically, because we cannot go back and forth to meet, but once actually she came to see me in Italy, and so I wanted to invite her and ask her what has happened since. And if you like to introduce yourself a little bit and see what, what you're up to now. Okay. Well, thanks, Heidi. Um, so uh, just, just as initial clarification, hi, I'm Gina Donaldson. I am the uh, partner navigating officer for personal passage planning, which helps uh, people prepare, respond and recover from life events, whether they're planned or unplanned. And so, uh, as part of, of part of that work, I'm on a constant journey and uh, my journey is taking me to a new place. But I would like to just clarify that although uh, I do look out at the United States from my kitchen window, I'm actually Canadian. So I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, easy to overlook that. I'm still in North America. So in that sense, American. Uh, so yeah, so where, where life has taken me, what I, what I do is I work with uh, clients, mostly older adults, because they're the ones who understand that um, life can throw you some interesting curves, whereas uh, sometimes other people think that those, those things don't happen. And what's come up in post conversations uh, with my clients? So, you know, I've set them up and then I go back and see how they're doing. And what's come up is that they're feeling bored and lonely and they're not sure what to do next. And because of my relationship also with a number of uh, older elder friendly community networks in, in my city here in Victoria, uh, I become aware of the, what the networks are saying. And one of the things that I was asked was, can you come and speak to my staff about what people should do later in life? And I'm, I was thinking, well, what makes me an expert? I mean, I'm just sort of starting this journey. So why are you asking me? And then, uh, much to my own surprise, I was out of the blue recruited. Would you like to come do a master's in psychology, which is my background? And I realized that as much as I wanted to do that earlier in my life, uh, that this point in my life, I still wanted to go back to school and learn in a very different way. So I found a program at our local university called Social Dimensions of Health which is a interdis interdisciplinary program between multiple faculties, faculties you wouldn't even imagine had anything to do with aging. Because my interest became, what is aging all about? What stories have we told ourselves? Are we actually making the best use out of these this gift of life? Particularly since if you were born in the 50s, you got about 18 more years more than you planned and maybe more than your parents. So what to do with this aspect of life? And I realized that there didn't seem to be a lot of options. And so though, although I understood a lot about grief and dying, I really hadn't delved into what about some of the more positive things that we could do in life. And learning came up for me as one of the ways that um, we can find ourselves in a social situation again. So. You know, it's fine for me, I read books and I go online and I read editorials, that's great, but I'm not really being social in, in that respect. So it's the interaction and maybe the challenging with other people mm -hmm. that will maybe help address this. And so I had to be willing to get out of my comfort zone and go from self-learning into a more academic, rigorous, research-oriented, formal program. And so I actually, it was very challenging as an older adult to do that because they wanted to uh, send us two essays from your uh, most recent uh, courses signed by your professors saying that you make a good candidate. Well, I haven't been in school for 20 years, so I don't have those anymore. Tracking down f five different universities of transcripts when they went, oh, I don't know, well, we'll have to look way back. To get those. <laughs> so it was kind of an, it was kind of interesting, but I was, I think I was really blessed uh, in that, first of all, I have a supportive spouse, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I encountered a psychology prof who's a friend who said, you need to do this program. And then I had to go find two people to be my supervisors. And the two people I found were perfect. So one fellow, uh, he comes from uh, more of a pu public policy background, but he did his master's later in life and his PhD when he's 55. Oh, so I have somebody who can actually understand that it's okay to learn later in life. And my other supervisor uh, is two years from retirement. And she's like, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to be doing after. So mm -hmm. she said, it'll be kind of fun to have an older adult in the classroom. And the idea is that you come from different backgrounds and different purposes for being there. And then you learn uh, whatever area you've chosen. And okay, my thing is what we do. A moment, because I want to encourage you. When I was in the integral conference in um, South Africa in 2019, mm -hmm. I got to know a lady. She was, I think, 87 or something, or 86, and she did her her PhD with 83. Ah, there so, you go. <laughs> yes, there you go. And she was good. I mean, she just needed uh, some help to to put it into mm -hmm. into words. Her whole life experience. She worked with. Um, the black community and uh, the communication and everything in integral with spiral dynamics, and so it was amazing to 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 witness this old lady and how she was alive. Unfortunately, she died about two or three years ago. But I mean, isn't it amazing? So you are in good company. I wanted to say that <laughs> older people who are starting well, to to do these things, you know. Yeah. And I think there's, because one of the things you realize is that particularly like when you've had the advantage to travel or, or read, read different things out of your own uh, interest is there's a lot we don't know. Yeah. And once you start on something, if, if you're curious, then that can take you to some pretty interesting places. And so for instance, when I went to uh, Italy last where we were, uh, uh, in the south of Italy, where when we went to Venice, I understood that I knew nothing about Venice except that it had canals. So then I came home and I read a book on Venice. I didn't feel motivated to do it beforehand, yeah. but afterwards I did. And then what I wanted was somebody else who knew something about Venice to compare notes with me. And that yeah. way I would have had a social experience with somebody else who had a mutual interest in the same topic mm -hmm. so it's it's creating those moments um with sometimes people you know and people you don't know to say let's have an interesting conversation and get to know and exactly stay engaged that way so yeah. these uh, studies you are doing at academically what are they containing and how do you uh connect the the aging thing with that so basically it's a it's a two-year program and the main core courses there's three are a colloquium so we are going to get exposed to a number of different lectures covering a number of different topics that speak to the social dimensions of health so my interest is in older adult learning somebody else's might be in public policy somebody else's might be indigenous um growth or social isolation like we're going to come with very different uh, goals and they they can't tell me what the which each lecture is going to be yet because the classes start next week but that's where we're all going to come together and be exposed to just a myriad of subjects supporting that are three methodology courses so and they're all from different faculties so you have to learn how to do research in the social environment and be effective. So one of my courses is with a sociology prof and one of my courses is with a human geography prof. And well, I've never even heard of human geography before. Yeah. I had no concept. It basically refers to the social structures that uh, it engage people and in social structures, okay? Uh, and then uh, specifically, I'm gonna have the, the privilege of uh, working with my supervisor on his course, which is all about aging. So the aspects of aging specifically, 
And then following that, I will work with uh, the number one guy at UVic, uh, Stuart McDonald, who's our expert on later in life and talks about living well to 100 plus uh, and working with him on aging. So I'm allowed to specialize specifically in aging and older adults in my electives and then bringing together this myriad of views. Mm -hmm. And are you also doing research on some topic with, uh, I mean, uh, also going yes. and with older people and collecting experience or what? Yes. So that is why they focus a lot on the setting up the discipline of a methodology so that you can do your, your master's thesis in the second year. So the second year is pure research projects. Uh, I suspect, having done a, a methods course before, uh, mm -hmm. that we'll do many many projects along the way in the, each of these courses. It's just the suspicion that go and try this method and go see how it works. So I do expect to be doing some mini research projects before I come to terms with how tight is my thesis and have I, what have I learned in the last year and what, how does that maybe varied um, uh, what I started off with? Because I've just started, so, you know. Mm -hmm. I find it amazing because you have a background in military, no? You and yes. coming over to a completely different thing, you know. That's how did that happen? <laughs> well, it is kind of interesting when you think about it. So yes, I did start off within our armed forces, and I was a naval administration officer. Uh, but what that meant is that I was actually dealing with people and mm -hmm. policy, performance, behavior, leadership. So the people side of change. Um, and when you're in the armed forces, change happens to you all the time. So you're con constantly learning. You're doing courses for in order to get promoted. You're moving to new jobs every two years. So there's learning. And so this integration with other people and learning as part of how you spend your life actually was pretty ingrained in the 16 years I was uh, in uniform. So it doesn't look like a social fit, but in fact, it's how do you lead and specifically how do you lead change mm -hmm. as well as operating within a structure. So operating within an armed forces environment is an environment, but then when we go to society, we still operate within an environment because there are social norms and there are cultures and there's policies and there's procedures and all those sorts of things. So it's just switching the framework a little bit. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that, that you already worked sort of in the similar way so that you are doing, let's say, an additional uh, academic roundup, sort of. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, in between, I worked in uh, uh, business change. So I've done change with uh, uh, governments and non-for-profit organizations. So again, leading change within a structure and moving from how do we do things today to how do we think we should do them in the future? So it it it's a similar path. It's just that the road changes a little bit, and who we meet along the road changes. Um, but I'm I'm. People say, "What are you going to do with this?" And I'm like, "I have no idea." But what I suspect, I given my background, is that it will take me somewhere where I'm going to help advocate for increasing quality of life for older adults, and I'm probably going to work in a different way with older adults to help them understand that it's possible. That's There's it. more possibilities. And so we're, it's like, can I open you up to the realm of the possible? Yeah, that's, that's good. I was thinking, first of all, it's you. You are not too young anymore. You are not old, but you have found for you the what you want to do in the later years that's the first thing mm -hmm. and then having gone through this experience and having the capacity to interact with people you easily can inspire older people because what i see uh, in many cases when people go older than they go, oh, what should i do actually when mark died i had, I had two years or three years and what do i do now you know it was I was, I mean, I have enough to do here with the gardens and everything, but is it this, you know, I was a little bit, I continued a little bit to do the interviews and things, but I thought, is it this what I want to do in later years? 
And then actually came COVID and all these things. And, and then I dived into, into history and into all these uh, politics and stuff. And I thought, oh dear, what I didn't know all my life. Yes, <laughs> I know. That's, that's what happened to me too. I'm like, I don't know if I had an education. I know I went to school. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it seems that we, we didn't learn a lot <laughs> in school. No, no, I don't feel particularly... Um, not to slam Canada too bad, but the number of times I learned about the first hundred years of our country, number of times, it was a repetitive, but I didn't learn enough about Europe. I didn't learn enough about Asia. I didn't learn enough about Africa. Uh, and so now when I'm reading historical fiction, which is very pleasurable, I'm like, there's so much, you see the patterns of human behavior repeating, the power, the economics, the history, opens up a whole new world. You can also uh, learn about the different uh, uh, perspectives with other cultures mm -hmm. uh, go into life, you know, and uh, how mm -hmm. we, uh, that is amazing for me, how we, let's say, Westerners think in a certain way and pretend that everybody needs to think this way, but it's not. I mean, yeah. a Chinese no. person with a background of Confu Confucianism or how it is called, mm -hmm. Yes, think a completely different way than we do. And I didn't know many of these things, you know, and also no, the political history and all these things. I was out of, not interested at all in politics, you know, and now I think, oh, okay, you didn't know that, you know. And so it's, it feels for me a little bit like you're doing, but without the university, that I dive into subjects which I never knew about and which is you know, like rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Deeper. Yes. Deeper. Yes. Yes. Which, <laughs> yeah, it is exciting. And I think one of the other things is that despite the fact that I'm going back to a formal environment, it's really just because I want to be challenged in a way that I don't challenge myself. And I think I personally feel that that was a been a lifelong goal for me to get this far. And because of my career and um, my husband's career, we moved too often for me to accomplish this. But it's not just about going to a school because there are so many people who are in rural areas, isolated areas, maybe not of an economic, um, sufficient economic wealth to be able to engage in the things that people say they do, for instance, after retirement, I'm going to travel, I'm going to garden, I'm going to cook a golf, but those are, those are not necessarily available to everyone. So how do you open a door for somebody who's in a very isolated area and how can you make community? So we're lucky, as you say, in some cases, it may have to be an online community, mm -hmm. but at least there's community. Mm -hmm. And older people often struggle with the uh, technical things, so they need uh, support with uh, coming into Zoom, for instance. It's not so difficult, but imagine the older people also here in the countryside have never worked with a computer, never don't yeah. even know what it is. And that is much rarer now, but a few years ago, before COVID, uh, nobody of the older 70 plus uh, knew how to, to, to talk. I had many people that I invited them into, oh, how shall we do that, you know? So it is wonderful that we have these means of, of communication, you know? And so I tell you, I live quite isolated, you know, you know yes, my place. I know. Um, Mm -hmm. If I hadn't internet, if I hadn't Zoom, I have so many groups now and, and people to talk to, but not necessarily here. There are some people now, experts as uh, Americans or Germans with whom I have contact, but only lately in the last few years, not before. Mm -hmm. I would be dead, let's say, when if I yeah. bore, bore them, because it's nice to watch the plants and work with animals and so on. But sure. It's not all, you know, you need... It's not <laughs> enough. ...exchange. I exactly. Know. Well, you know, and I, you know, just uh, just that personal contact. And, you know, it's the isolation because, you know, as we lose our friends, and I've lost lots of friends this year, it's been very hard. As our circles get smaller, we're not sure if we can make new friends or acquaintances. And so people don't necessarily make that effort. But actually, 
there's a lot of people who could use some new friends. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and you'll find things in common. Yeah, 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 yeah. When on internet, so. you have the possibility to find them, you know. And when you yes. have the basics of, of interaction, how to do this, yeah. And then, in, as in my case, you have to create the community yourself if you want. I mean, you don't need to have any communities around you can join, you know, that's uh, also, mm -hmm. I find it. And I think, yeah, okay, go ahead. Sorry. And I think the other thing is even sometimes when you have a community, so, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people who are going into um, independent living, assisted living, long-term care. But when we think about what kind of environment are we creating there, and I think that's why this one fellow wanted me to come to his uh, uh, <clears throat> assisted living uh, residence, is what are we doing with people once they are in care? Are we actually creating communities in there? Are we enriching their lives? Are we taking them on adventures? So when I see um, older adults bouncing a balloon over a dining room table and that's their activity for the day. It may be convenient for the staff and I don't think these people have any lack of intellectual capacity. So if you take away this sort of jubilizing of adults and put together a more interesting program, why for instance, wouldn't you run a series on, hi, we're going to Italy this month. So we're gonna, choose a story, you can choose a romance, you can choose a history, we're going to have some Italian food, we'll learn 10 words in Italian every day. But doing something that takes the uh, engagement beyond a simple activity. So what do you talk about after you've batted a balloon? Not much. But what do you talk about if you've attended a session, information session, and then you go have a coffee with someone was in the same session, right? So the experience, I, I have a friend, she worked here up there in the beginning of our road, there is an old people's home, something like that, where you're talking about, and she worked there. And she said, people come in still mentally alive. And after four or five weeks, weeks they are down because yeah. staff has no time at all to, to to do anything with them except, you know, the necessary care. And then they are put in front of the television, that's it. And yeah. I mean, that is, seems to be like, you know, like a place where waiting for death, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. they are parked there more or less. But um, how do you think practically this can be? We are in a capitalist um as, as environment and everything should uh, be paid and costs a lot of money and so how how would you think that this is possible well i think that when people as you say and they come into let's just say uh supported living just to because we used to have so many terms for these things if they come in uh intellectual there's no reason why somebody else has to do it for them so for instance at one of our new residences um, a woman, she's in her 90s, and she is a very established author, published author. Does she need to go to something or can she create something? Yeah. So you shouldn't always have to pay for everything that happens in these care residences. So to what extent can the community in those residences take charge of their own happiness versus completely succumbing uh, to a, uh, an environment of compliance mm -hmm. and other people's schedules. And what I'm hearing also from what you said before, maybe inspire people before they go in these places to have their, their subject of interest and be keen on doing it, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that it continues versus it, it comes to a halt. Um, so... But if you have to create that that space for people, and sometimes uh, when you go from a comfortable environment like your home to a new place, you're just trying to fit in and there's so much adjustment. So I think in some cases, when this is why it's the area of study I'm doing, you have to understand the environment. What have you put people in? And to what extent can they manage that environment? Because they're paying for it in some cases. They're paying a lot. So they should be able to say, 
I'm interested in doing this as a program, or I'm happy to lead this, or I'd like to see this, you know, I'd like to go on an outing that involves more than walking around a mall. Because sometimes that's all they do. They go for a walk in a mall. Not even it's in great the- for exercise in bad weather. But yeah. <laughs> so sure. I think in some cases, this is where we have to take some responsibility for our own happiness. But the thing that often stands in the way is a, your own belief system that you can't make your own happiness later mm-hmm. in life. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've said so many things to people like, uh, and we know they're not true anymore. So can an old dog new, learn new tricks is one of my favorites because people say it all the time. And we always believe they couldn't. Mm-hmm. But in fact, we can because mm-hmm. we now know, first of all, it's important to keep learning for mm-hmm. your mental health and uh, physiological also, health. Also moving, also going for And moving. Because that yeah, keeps and moving. your life. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So we know that we have neuroplasticity. Uh, which means we can learn new things. So the, the, the important thing for with older adults is helping them understand that, yeah, you know, actually you started aging at 25, by the way. So you've been doing this for a long time. Uh, you learn differently. You learn more slowly. You may not learn as, um, you may not pay attention to some things that are easier for younger people to pay attention to. But one of the things my supervisor told me, he said, Gina, you know, the, the funny thing is about older adults is they just need a little bit more time on the exam. They'll do as well as anybody, if not better. But a younger person may be able to complete the exam, let's say, in two and a half hours, and an older adult may need three and a half. But the quality does not diminish with age. So even when people get frustrated, well, I can't remember this, or my memory is fading, or... No, you, you have to understand, okay, that's your environment, but that's not just your limitations. You have a different way of learning or a being, exactly. but you also have, you have huge potential, yeah. huge potential. Yeah, and that's, uh, it's wasted when people, they are waiting for retirement to sit somewhere on the beach, you know, and then what? Mm-hmm. And many men, especially, they die after a year or two because they don't, the, the life makes no sense anymore, no? And right. uh, yeah, and it's important to c- cultivate interests, you know? Mm-hmm. So to your point, um, one of the early stats we have for people uh, leaving the armed forces is they would collect 22 pension checks, 22 months, because they lost their purpose, their yeah. identity and their purpose. Yeah. So part of... Part of, you know, how do we shift our thinking about uh, later life is if your original purpose when you were born was to go to school and be a child to become an adult. And then as a young adult, maybe you became a mother or a father, or maybe you went to school, maybe you got a job, whatever you did, that part, it's sort of like society pushed you in a particular direction. But imagine when you may not have to work. You may not have to raise a family. Um, you can do what you want. So really, rather than this being a time of negative decline, what if it's the super opportunity to become something that either you wanted to be or never dreamed of being, but you can be? And if we look at it that way, it doesn't have to be the same thing. Like, I figure I've got at least 30 years to go. So investing two years and figuring out what I'm going to make out of that seems minor. Nothing mm-hmm. compared to the investments I made earlier in life. So, yeah, I, and I don't have to do it for 30 years. Like, what if I only do the next thing for four years? Mm-hmm. One year? Mm-hmm. doesn't matter. It's just as long as you're doing something. Yeah. But it's a, it is a, a question of a question of, of perspective. It's a question of also beliefs. Because I think the problem when people die as as soon as they are in pension is that they cannot imagine, they don't know what to do with the freedom they have now. Right. It's like boring and not, it has not the same worth, the same value, mm-hmm. you know, than before. When you were a manager or something, you seemed that's, uh, that is important. And now you are nobody. 
when you are out of your work and before you were, you know, everybody admired you and now there's nobody to admire you. And people who have created their identity around that, they really have a problem to to know who they are themselves. I would say a spiritual path would be good for them. <laughs> yes. Learn, yeah, to learn a little bit, who am I really? Am I only the, the boss or whatever they did? Or is there a little bit more <clears throat> to me, you know? Yeah. How do I define myself? Well, I think one of the things that I've really appreciated is seeing what people um, who came out of um, very structured environments like government, who had no idea what they wanted to do when they retired. They just knew they wanted to retire. Okay, so they retire. Then for some reason, for no explanation, they decide to take a drawing course because they didn't know how to draw. Okay takes a drawing course. Oh, well, there's some logic to this. I can draw funny things now. Well, maybe I'll take a pastel course. Oh, this is interesting. Maybe I'd like to try watercolors. Maybe I'd... The fact that I've seen a woman who's never drawn in her life after retirement, her paintings, Heidi, are so beautiful. She says, do you know there's at least 26 whites we can choose from? So I love painting with white now. I'm like, her paintings are beautiful. She also didn't know how to read music. Mm -hmm. She decided she'd like to learn the ukulele. Lots of people, older adults, pick up ukulele because we here in Canada, we have programs available for that for some reason because it's not introduced, introduced in school, okay? She had to learn to read music. Okay, she learned to read music. She learned to play the ukulele. She plays classical music on a ukulele all within a couple of years of retirement. And... She would have never dreamed those things. I would be interested in what in us is allowing us to do this and what is hindering us not to do this, you know? How mm -hmm. come that some people find the way and some just give up, you know? That's for me is interesting. Mm -hmm. I have no answer on that, but have you an idea? I just think that we've, society has told us what we can't, can't do. And so we believe it mm -hmm. and therefore we don't try. And I think it's because it's very easy to just let things happen to you if nobody else around you is doing something interesting as well. Yeah, the environment so, is important, you know. And maybe also the the inspiration that there's somebody around and says, Oh, you you try that, you know, try it. If they are alone. It's difficult to self-inspire oneself, you know, yeah. And I think the other thing is that, you know, we've probably, you know, in life we've made lots of mistakes. We've had lots of failures. Uh, we've been judged. Mm -hmm. And in some ways people may say, I just don't want to be judged anymore. Mm -hmm. So how do you create an environment where, let's say I thought, well, she learned to draw, that I can learn to draw. I, I suspect I couldn't possibly learn to draw. But no, <laughs> that's okay. If I tried it, if I at least tried it, I went, okay, well, that's not it. But maybe there's something else that I, I, I can do. And so it's not that you have to be able to do everything, but, you know, even just, even just learning a song or getting involved in a choir or anything, like learn to read music that way or learn new songs or a dance, like dancing, uh, a lot of our various cultures have beautiful dances where your social interaction but you have to learn to do the dance yeah but there and are there's... also often uh, uh, other um, contact dancing a friend of mine is doing contact dancing you don't have to learn steps there that's something different i don't actually know what exactly it is but it's not like a, a waltz or something you know so yeah but I think I think it's just a matter of where we just we're not sure. I don't think we actually ever had serious conversations about what do you do. And I'm going to use uh, uh, 65 as a benchmark. What do you do after 65? Because that's when most people consider that to be senior citizens. Mm -hmm. um, nobody talked about it. And so you weren't really prepared. And there's a big difference between when we all live together, multi-generational families that the the elders or the grandmas and grandpas and the omas and the opas would would look help do cooking, help do 
cleaning, help to look after children, maybe teach an art, like a beading or a sewing or something. But we just don't tell people. We don't we just don't have those conversations. And this is this is, I think, where you know, the sort of work that you're doing, where you have conversations with people. What if we start, said you need to prepare more for when you are not working or when you've raised your children um, and just just have a way of looking at what is the realm of the possible? You know what? I have an idea. You should create a podcast and, and, and bring this into the world, you know? <laughs> Okay, but I think I have a friend Heidi who has great podcasts who can who can do that. No, I I mean with this topic, you know, to mm -hmm. inspire mm -hmm. people, to find uh, other people who are uh, in this mindset and 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 find mm -hmm. the success stories, for instance, invite them. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily talk about me, but I talk about you to do a. a yeah. um, th this yeah. is a sort of not teaching, but it's it's, it's inspiration. It's, you mm -hmm. can. You know, you can do it. This is the message that we can, yes. could be spread, you know, in, by internet, you know, for these people. Yeah, because you, you just need to work within whatever, I, you would, whatever your means are. You can work within your means and your capacity to find new, new things to do. So if, for instance, you were used to being athletic, but you can't be as athletic in the same way? Is there another way to be athletic? Can you inspire someone else? Because volunteering, for instance, is one of the greatest ways to connect with people and to feel good about yourself. So altruistic behavior towards others results in a feel-good feeling for you. And, you know, lots of people, uh, they just, they do volunteering and that's how they find their purpose in later life. And it isn't necessarily about formal learning. It's more about how do you maintain social engagement and interaction and a feel good sense. So you get out of, you have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, exactly. Like, like those blue zones, they all say you have a reason to get up. It, even if it, it's a simple of tasks, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just has to have purpose. This is also the reason why many people like myself also, but it's not the primary reason, have animals and garden. You have to get up. You have to give yes. them food. You have to water the plants. And if you're feeling bad, you feel bad, but you do this, you know. And this yes. is as soon as you are in a little bit, let's say, depressive state and you do all these things, being up is already a big thing than to feel differently. Mm -hmm. And then you see, oh, it's working. I don't need to stay in bed and something, you know. So mm -hmm. if it is uh, animals or if it is some, how do you call them, grandchildren or, or whoever, that's, we need to find a reason for living. And we had sort of found it before in some way because it was attributed to us. You find a job and you, you have to work and blah, blah, blah. And this seemed to be the reason for life. But maybe there are better reasons for living than, than... Yeah, and I and I one of my one of my um friends, so I have a lot I have a lot of friends who are in their 80s. And she says, I just need something to look forward to. Exactly. And it doesn't have to be even tomorrow, because if I get out of it tomorrow and I do something for me tomorrow, I know that five days from now or even a month from now. I have something to look forward to. So what you do between uh, those events where something a little bigger to look forward to and the little things that you can do along yeah. the way. Exactly. It's a little bit what I do. I'm looking forward to my groups or to the interview or something, you know, that's a sort of highlight of, uh, of the week, let's say, you know, that's yes. energizing. It's, it's, yeah. Well, Look how look how long we took to plan this, Heidi. Yeah. You know, so you know we 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 get caught up in lots of things in between. But uh, I was very excited to just reach out to you again and say, "Hey, Heidi, I COVID, I've missed you." Uh, mm -hmm. And then you suggested this conversation. So yes, I had a, a a bit of a new story to tell with going back to school. Uh, but also, it was a it was a pleasure to know that we were going to have a conversation today. Mm -hmm. And so it's been in my calendar, in your, your calendar, and I'm like, yes, I'm going to get to talk to Heidi today, and we'll see where that goes. 
And we, I would like to inspire people who are listening to this to create events like this, you know, and if you yes. don't sit in the backyard, then go online, learn this little bit you need to learn for having conversations, uh, video, and not only tele telephone, because video is mm -hmm. much nicer to talk together, because it's like, yes. if we, almost like if we were in the same room. So yeah, inspiration. Yeah. And and I think the other thing that comes with the, the visuals is that we actually depend for our communication on a lot of subconscious visuals. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to, when there's no person in front of you, you, you don't get those clues and you may be thinking the conversation is going well, but maybe it's not. Or you want to see the joy in their face yeah, and because you've said something. The way of interacting is different. When I yesterday I had one person in a group only tele telephone, and when she spoke, I'm going then in listening, and I'm not not connecting anymore in this way. When I talk to you, mm -hmm. I look into your eyes, and there I'm going sort of inward to be able to listen well, you know, because it's mm -hmm. missing. These other clues are missing, which makes understanding much easier, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. which is why we have struggles with email because actually email we haven't evolved to be good, super good communicators in email. We need those visual subconscious yeah, clues. Emails are always it's good that they exist, but they are always mm -hmm. a reduction of of possibility. So many things can be misunderstood by writing. Mm -hmm. Why, when we look at each other, then it's clear what we mean. It might be some mm -hmm. ironic or whatever in writing. The other person might not understand it. You know, so yeah. We can only encourage people to go and learn and something new and find the the purpose of the later years of, of life, the sense of Enjoy. life. Enjoy. Enjoy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy sometimes, but it's possible. It's possible. That is the message which I hear you giving to the world, and that's wonderful. And I thank <laughs> you for this conversation and hope we could thank you, Heidi. somebody to get up with joy up. and do something. It must not be important. You don't need no. to see the world of anything, you know, but just in your in your possibilities. So wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure, Heidi. Yeah. Bye-bye for the moment. Bye.